he will go through the material in a very specific manner. And he relies on feedback and questions from you guys to explore areas of the material that might not have been specifically understood in the way he presented. Let me give you guys every single uh, Any other questions? You guys are seeming like a little wary now about the class. <laughs> It's a fun class. You'll learn a lot. Like I have to stress that. It's just um, I don't. Have you guys taken like any of like the? I mean, honors at the ARC is hit and miss. But like, have you guys had good experience with an honors class before where like you really learn a lot out of it that you have to work in? It's kind of like that. Um, this is definitely one of the funnest uh, computer science classes I've taken here. So, but yeah. Once again, it's just like you really have to uh, keep up on stuff. Oh, and that's the other thing. So um, projects. Projects can get ahead of you if you don't stay on top of them, which is another useful aspect of media. Because you have a dedicated period to your like work and stuff. Alright. Well, uh, my email's right there. Is that actually legible to you guys? Because yeah. I know my handwriting is awful. Perfect. Alright. Alright, well I'm not sure is the mic working? I don't think it's working. Is it? No. Well, it's on, but I think the other side is not turned on yet. And I don't know exactly which one it is. Well, can people in the back still hear me okay? All right, so I'm not, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna worry about this. <clears throat> All right, this is our first class. Um, so Cameron probably did a pretty good job uh, convincing you that this class is really difficult, right? I don't know, you know, I would be the last person to really correctly assess you know, the difficulty of this class. You know, people keep asking me for each test, is it going to be an easy test? I go like, no, I don't know, you know don't ask me. <laughs> I can answer that you know, after the test and after I grade everything, but not right now. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at the syllabus first. Um, and as Cameron mentioned, you know, I screen record everything. So that means everything on the projector, as well as my voice, is recorded. Okay, and I push everything to YouTube. It's not just recorded and saved and then uploaded later. It is actually streamed to YouTube. So if you want to double check and make sure that the voice is okay, because this is my mic, um, it's good. Yeah. You just check. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that's what I do. Um, so each lecture is 80 minutes. So every lecture, you know, there's 80 minutes on YouTube. Um, so the way you access YouTube is just to go to YouTube and you go to some profs, some professors. And this is my channel. I share the channel with a few other professors. But most of the other professors are not using the channel anymore. Once it is recorded, um, I will change the name because I just use a template. Um, YouTube doesn't let me um, you uh, specify the name, you know, where how I want to save it. And I, I was just testing it a few times you know, earlier, so a lot of these clips are actually useless. So once I save it, I will save it using a name kind of like this one. <clears throat> so it will be the date. 2018 for this class, 01 for this month, and then 16 for today, and then CISP 310 for the class code. So this is how you can locate um, the recording for this class based on the date and also based on which class you're taking. Is that okay? I do have recording of this class and many other classes that I have taught for the past three years. So if you want to get a preview of what I might be talking about in the next class, you can actually check out you know, the you know, recording that's already on YouTube. Okay, but I wouldn't spend too much time doing that. You know, if you just want to get a rough idea, that's a great idea. But if you want to know exactly what I'll be, I'll be talking about, you know, I change the content or the ordering of the content almost on a per semester basis. So I might change that order a little bit um, this semester. Are there any questions about where to find the video uh, recording for this class? Does anyone need accessibility, uh, like closed captioning, that sort of thing? No? Okay, if you do and you don't want to let me know in the class, you'll just email me after class, and I'll make sure that there's closed captioning available. 
in the recording. YouTube does a pretty good job already. All right, any other questions? No questions? Yep, go ahead. Uh, looking online, there's not really a schedule for like, uh, set times for like the exams and the That is correct. So the so when I go over the syllabus, I'll mention you know what, how I arrange that. So when you look at you know when you sign into Canvas and click on this class, there's an overall schedule. Okay, but this schedule is tentative, which basically means it gives you a kind of rough timeline of you know, what topic I'll be talking about and when I'll be talking about those topics. Um, I use it as a guide of what I need to talk about, but I do not necessarily follow these particular dates. Okay? Um, is that okay with you guys? Yeah. All right. I mean, as in not just understanding okay, but, you know, okay, you know, this class is a little bit, you know, unstructured sometimes. But ironically, it's called the organization of computers. <laughs> All right, so getting on to the syllabus, you know, I, I know this is a quote-unquote waste of time, but, you know, it, it has to be done. Um, so, you know, this part is not that important. I'm going to keep moving forward. Um, I am changing my office hours, so the office hour on my timesheet next to my cubicle is actually outdated. This is the correct one. So my name is Tack. Just call me Tack. My last name is almost unpronounceable the way it is specified here. Uh, it's a Cantonese last name, but Cantonese has sounds that are missing in English. So this is an approximation, and it's pretty hard to pronounce. But TAC, I think everybody can pronounce. TAC is in take tac toe right? <laughs> so spell differently, but same pronunciation. So email address is uh, ayant at arc.lostwheels.edu. And my office is kind of dependent on the day. On Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'll be in the design, the, the Tech Ed 311. I think that's going to change. Uh, that's going to be changed to 309 uh, because 311 has a class going during that time. Um, I can talk about Design Hub a little bit more later on, but right now I'm just going to say, okay, you know, the Design Hub is where I'm going to have my office hour on the first three days of the week. On Thursdays, um, my office hour is back to my actual cubicle. Um, it's CNC or Computer Math Complex. Sounds like a disorder. Um, 404 is the name of the room. Um, and my office is the third one on the left hand side. You know, once you walk in, you will find it because we have nameplates. On Friday, it is online, okay? but the time is from 11 to noon time and I will make it available so that you guys can live chat with me. Um, if you want to talk to me in, you know, in person, you can just let me know. I can come back on campus on Friday. That's not a problem. Yep? Thursday from 6 to 7 No, that is military time. So this is 4.30 to 7.20. I mean, uh, to 5.20. Yeah. So it's right, um, kind of right before the first lab, the early lab. Are there any questions about how to contact me, you know, by phone, by email, or where to find me when? Yep. Just to reiterate, you said that elsewhere this was the incorrect office hours, but these are correct? The these are correct as, yeah, right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, just change uh, Tech Ed 311 to possibly 309. If I'm not in 311, I'll be in 309. All right. Yeah, so when we get to the point where we want to talk about your know, design hub, um, I would have certain people who are already in the design hub doing internship to help explain what it is about. Okay, is that okay? Okay, cool. All right, <clears throat> so moving along, um, the content of this class will be delivered by, you know, sometimes video clip, but for the most part, this is a face-to-face -face class, so I'll just be here to explain the content. But since it is, it's also recorded, so you can kind of count it as video clips, um, there will be reading material and interactive activities. You know, some of you have already done the, uh, the interactive activities for today. If you're in the earlier lab, if you're in the, in the later lab, you'll be doing it at 8.30. Okay. So moving on. 
uh, regular effective content or regular effective communication policy. <clears throat> so how do we stay in touch? Okay, this is a face-to-face -face class, so most of the time we don't have issues with this. <clears throat> you can contact me by office. You, know, you, you can use the office hours to talk to me about any issues that you might have. Um, email works really well. Your know, phone doesn't work as well because you know I'm usually not next to the phone. But these days, you know, if you leave a message, it will be sent to me by email as MP3. So it's pretty convenient. Um, you can also use the text messaging um, ability of Canvas to contact me, and that's the preferred way to contact me. Because of this way, you know, it leaves a trail on Canvas, and that's what the college wants, is to have you know, a trail of communication so that you know, when it's time for our accreditation, they can show the trail of you know, communication to the people who are doing the accreditation and go like, yes, our professors do talk to the students. Well, I mean, it's pretty hard to not to do that in a face-to-face -face class. I would have to basically turn my back and you know, just write on the whiteboard or the blackboard the whole time and not turn around and talk to you. Any eye contact is already you know, some interaction. Okay, time frame policy, basically, you know, um, uh, during the weekdays, you know, I will turn around in about 24 hours with email and stuff like that. Uh, during the weekend, you know, it's about 48 hours, two days. But once again, it's a face-to-face -face class. If you've got questions, ask the questions in class. If, you, if it's a longer question, you want to show me something, your code is not working or something, you, it's kind of more involved, use the lab time. If that is not enough, then use the office hour. Is that okay? All right. Okay, moving on. Etiquette policy, just kind of the usual stuff, you know, don't do anything that other people can be considered as hostile, can be considered as harassment, can be considered as discrimination. Okay, so I'm not going to spell out exactly, you know, all those things. First day of class, you know, people who are missing the first day of class are automatically dropped. Um, that's a district-wide policy. So if, you, if you're here, you know, you don't have to worry about it. But if, on the other hand, if you're watching this from home right now in real time, you're dropped. <laughs> <laughs> um, accommodations, this is for ADA compliance. Um, if you need any type of help, you, know, um, you can contact our disabled, I cannot remember, oh, right there, okay. Disabled Student Program and Services, DSPS, and they can arrange um, resources for those who need these resources. Excessive absence, this is kind of important. Um, the district defines excessive absence as 6% or more absences. Okay, so that's relative to all the meeting time that we have in the whole semester. <clears throat> because this is about, um, so the math that I did over here is basically saying, okay, because you know, we have 54, you, um, in terms of units, you know, that's the unit time, and then each hour has 60 minutes. Each actual lecture is only 80 minutes. So each lecture is about 2.47% of all the lectures in the whole semester. So in order to be excessive, somebody will have to miss uh, classes three times or more with unex uh, unexcused. If you're sick, you show me the doctor's note, it is excused. Is that okay? All right, so you know, the first two unexplained absences is not excessive, but the third one is excessive. So the way I take role in this class is, you know, sometimes I just you know, pass a sheet of paper, but most of the time I can look at your online activity time and see if you sign into Canvas, you know, on the day and in the lab. Yep. Um, speaking of uh, excuse absences, does, are you willing to work with work schedules by anything like that? It is not a mandatorily accepted uh, excuse like being sick is. Um, so if you have issues with work and stuff like that, you'll just let me know ahead of time and we can, uh, I can see whether it is okay or not. So the point is I still want people to be in class, but if you need to kind of fudge the lab time or something along that line, you know, we can think, of, we can talk about it, but I cannot just blanket and go like, oh, okay, if it's work issue, it's okay. Yeah. 
right. Moving along. So the only excuses would be the health of the student himself or herself. You know, um, I do understand. You know, if you have kids or if you have parents, you know, and they're sick and you need to stay home. You know, so I kind of understand all that part. You know, but the only um, absences that has to be excused are you know sickness with a doctor's note. So if you're sick, you know, it is important for you to get a doctor's note to show me, you know, so that you know, that can be excused. So all of these are unexcused, okay, or you know, it is not mandatory that I have to, you know, have these excused. <coughs> is that okay? All right, so far. Uh, there's no quote-unquote late policy. Um, I just do not accept late work. Um, so you might want to kind of time your homework assignment, you know, and start doing it as soon as possible. If you encounter issues, like there are certain things, you know, you, you, get, you can get your homework done up to a certain point, but you cannot get past that point, you might want to let me know early as well so that I can, I'm aware of the situation and I can see if I can help you earlier. So are there any questions about these parts? Moving along. So you can look at uh, this. Look, you can look at these things as honesty versus you know, integrity. Um, so the bottom line is what the, the grade of a particular person should only reflect the uh, academic competency and achievement of that person. That's the bottom line. Okay, you know how, and so cheating or you know dishonesty is basically um, the attempt. Okay, right here. I'm just gonna. Highlighted. So it's the attempt to show possession of a level of competency, knowledge, or skill that is beyond the, uh, the level of the student. If it's below, it's okay. But if it's beyond, it is not. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that nobody is going to show a competency level that's below. But so the other way to look at this is to look at it from the integrity perspective. Okay, so basically the same thing is just defined a little bit differently. So now we have to go talk about you know the limits test, the limits test, um, because you know I really do not want to lock down and say okay you cannot help another your know, fellow student. That doesn't make sense to me. Okay, so why do you think it is important for you guys to kind of help out each other when you're doing your homework, when you're studying, when you're getting ready for tasks and stuff like that? Why is that important? How many people do it anyway? Okay, go ahead. Sometimes someone sees something you know. Mm -hmm. What about the times that you see something that the your your fellow student, your classmate, did not see? So what happens in the process of explaining that? Does it help you, or is, is it just really a waste of your time? Oh yeah, it helps you solidify your own knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Same, same, same point. Okay. So that's why you know I really want you guys to kind of help out each other because you know in the process of explaining a concept to another person, you get a newer depth of understanding of the material. I understand that part because I do it all the time because that's what I'm doing, right? So the limits test is basically to see if you know there's a the issue of you know, cheating, and basically the way it's done is to basically give a test to a particular student and see if you know that new test has the, about the same score as the test that is in question, because you know it, it should be consistent. You know if the you know, student in question did not receive any help, you know that is not supposed to be happening. So that's basically how I you know, determine whether that's the case or not. Okay, my battery is fully charged. <laughs> okay, so the so this part just you know talks about the importance of academic academic honesty. Um, is you know if I don't care, nobody cares. If, if Professor Fox doesn't care, and Professor Sabsevery doesn't care. If nobody cares about you know academic honesty or integrity. What's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen over time? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, but, but that's kind of, yes, but that's kind of in the future, yep. Uh, the 
Yeah, because all of you are transferring. And if ARC is well known to produce you know, students where you know, their actual their grade does not actually reflect their academic competency, you know, they get an A or B out of our classes, but when they you know, transfer to UC or CSU, you know, they underperform or they just cannot even finish the program. If that becomes a pattern, what do you think is going to happen to our accreditation with all of those universities? It's all going to go away. Right? So it's going to impact everybody. And that's part of the reason why it is important. So consequences would basically just be, OK, the, the work that is in question is going to get a zero. But at the same time, depending on the severity, it might be reported to my dean. And then my dean will take it you know, from that point, And it's up to her to decide what else you know, we can do about that. So getting, you know, So this part here is kind of important, too. How many people have read the Guide to Student Rights and Responsibilities? It's online, it's part of the, um, the online catalog. But that might be something that you might want to read because you know, it spells out you know, both your rights and your responsibilities. If I accuse you know, somebody you know, wrongfully, okay, you know, what, what can that person possibly do other than just complaining to me? There's a whole process. Okay, who do you contact on campus if something like that happens? So this document you know, kind of shows you what to do if you think that you're wrongfully accused, or you know, if you think, you know, okay, somebody is bugging me in the classroom, what can I do about that? You know, that sort of stuff. Classroom behavior, you know, this is not a kindergarten, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this one. So the bottom line is I don't want any disruptive behavior. Okay, you know, so um, if someone wants to fall asleep in the class, it's not okay. It's, it's, I take that. It is okay as long as there's no snoring. Because the snoring part can be a little bit distracting to the people around that person. But if someone just kind of needs to go like shut eye and you know, you know, doze off, you know, it's not a problem. The bottom line is I don't want it to impact the rest of the class. So the most common problem, you know, quote unquote problem that, that I usually have is chatting. And it's not even chatting in the sense of you know chit chatting. Right? This is chatting like somebody did not quite get what I said, okay, or you know did not could not copy what I just wrote you know in a program or something along that line, and would ask the person next to this person go like, okay, can I take a look at what you copied, okay, that sort of chatting, but that is disrupting the student that's you know being asked. So that's not good. Instead of asking the other person, you know, just raise your hand and let me know that you want to, you want me to flip back to the other screen. Okay, you know, that it's okay, not a problem. If you need more time to write down something on the projector, just let me know. Okay, because some people don't trust me. You know, occasionally I do have you know technical difficulties where you know I thought something is getting recorded and it's not, or I would forget to press the uh, start button to start the streaming. So occasionally that happens, and you might want to at least jot down some important notes. Um, interrupting usually does not happen. If you have a question, you know, if you want to say something about the subject matter, just raise your hand first. You know, and um, I don't think I have been known to like not address anyone. So does anyone want to try that now? Raise your hand and have, say something. No? OK, go ahead. Bananas. Okay, cool. You, you just you, you wanted me to say something. So yep. Yeah. And what does what does that mean? I, I it's a brew or <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's actually brew. It's okay. it's yellow. Orange. Well the later section has a whole there's a whole section on gibberish, so we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> So in this classroom, I think there's a sign, just like all the other classrooms. I don't know where they hide that sign. But no food, no drink, um, usually no kids and no cell phones. Um, with your cell phone, you can turn on do not disturb and link your do not disturb to your calendar. And you just put the class into your calendar. So your phone will automatically silence. And then after the class, it will turn back on automatically. So that's a pretty cool feature. Um, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, because in this classroom, we don't have computers in front of you. You know, it's just in front of me. If you need to drink like plain water, it's okay with me. You know, but you know, anything that's sweet or kind of has color, you know, 
Probably not a good idea. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, plain water is fine. You know, even if it's caffeinated, it's okay too. I know they, you know, there, there's caffeinated water. If not, you can go to the chemistry department. <laughs> Make your own caffeinated water. I don't think it tastes very good. Okay, so moving along. How to attend lectures. Most of you already kind of know that. Um, so I want to kind of emphasize that you know you um, even if I'm recording the class, there's still certain things you can do in class that can help you. Um, you might want to write down at what time I start to talk about which topic. So this way, you know, when you watch the videos again, you don't have to watch everything from start to finish. You can skip to a particular section and just go like, okay, I just need to listen to the whole lecture again, but only the section that talks about blah, blah, blah. So if you have a little index on your own, you can just you know, fast forward on YouTube to the section that you need without having to listen to the entire thing. So you might want to kind of keep track of the time you know, when I start to talk about something. Okay. Um, as, and also Cameron mentioned that uh, it's a good idea to remind me to start the recorder or the streamer. Okay, so you know, one of you, okay, you can rem remind me or check with me and say, are we recording? Okay, just kind of check with me you know, at the beginning of a lecture, so this way you know, we don't we don't miss that. Okay, uh, reading the material ahead of time is going to be helpful, even if you don't fully understand the concepts. At least you know what I'll be talking about and approximately what those things are about. Um, I obviously I forgot to update my notes <coughs> because the Moodle is not supposed to be existing anymore. Supposed to be. It is still there because um, someone forgot to turn it off. But the, uh, but anything, you know, all the links on Canvas, you know, are important. Um, and I usually just go sequentially down the list. So you pretty much have all the you know notes you know for the semester already. Um, I might be typing a little bit more later on in the semester because I, I still have some content that I need to transfer over. But reading ahead of time is, uh, is definitely going to be helpful. And then right after class, what do you do? Dinner, sleep, right? <laughs> well, if you have a chance, you, know, you might want to just kind of revisit you know, what was discussed in class. Okay, that is really helpful because your mind is fresh, it still remember most of that stuff. Um, you don't have to spend a lot of time, maybe 10, 15 minutes, just briefly go over what I talked about in class. That can be helpful. All right, so, so this is the part where, you know, Cameron said, you know, it, it, this class is not about memorization because all the tests are open book, open notes. Anything that is either handwritten or printed, you can bring. So there's nothing, I'm not requiring you guys to mem memorize anything. Why? Because I cannot. <laughs> but instead, I'm testing whether you understand the concepts and can use those concepts to solve problems. So it is about problem solving. Okay? <coughs> when you're done with this class, when you're done with ARC and you're done with a four-year university, possibly graduate school, what are you going to do? There's no more school, no more classes. What are you going to do? Sleep. 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 Okay. <laughs> Well, yes, we have to. We need to do that every day. Apply what else? Hmm? Apply your knowledge. Apply your knowledge at work, right? So, if you think about it, is there any change in the high tech industry? Like, you know, if you compare what it was, say, twenty years ago, and five years in the future, do you think there's a change of, you know, what people do on a daily basis? Twenty years ago, yeah. Go ahead. And if you think about exactly, so the miniaturization and also you know, the connectivity of devices is you know, there's no equal in the past. So in the good old days, you know, how do people write programs? You probably have heard about this from your uncles or grand great uncles and sort of Fortran. Fortran. But but what what do you do? Do you just you know, kind of type on the keyboard and and your editor will kind of fix your syntax errors along the way? You got punch cards and terminals. 
You got a punch card, exactly. So when you when you have a program, you have to punch holes on cards, you know, to enter the program. So do you get feedback right away, like, oh, you missed the semicolon right here, <laughs> or this class is wrong, or oh, let me suggest these particular methods of this particular object. None of that is going to happen, right? So what do you think of the development time? How much time does it take to actually get a program right back in those days compared to now? Much longer, okay? Because Fortran is not it's not even object oriented, okay? Everything is procedural. So the organization of your code is really tedious to begin with, okay? All right. So if that is the case, that means programming in the past, okay, you know, 20 years ago, has a lot of tedious chore kind of thing, right? Okay, it's kind of like you know cleaning the bathroom with a toothbrush. But these days, it's different. What do we have? We have Eclipse. We have all the IDEs, the Integrated Development Environments, where you type something and it can auto finish some of that. Okay. Um, and I did not even realize how powerful IDEs have become because I'm a VI person. I'm just I use plain editing editors. Um, so there was one semester I had to teach Java and I had to use Eclipse and go like type type, and it, it's all it's almost <laughs> auto finishing the rest. It's like wow, that is cool. Okay, so if if the tools are that advanced, okay, what do you think people are doing? <laughs> your, your employer is not going to allow that to happen. So what do your employers, you know, what do your employers expect now from employees? Oh, higher productivity. Okay. Higher productivity, but things that computers cannot yet automate, right? But don't you think you know, we are automating more and more stuff now? What's happening to the retail industry? Going down the drain. <laughs> There, there won't be a retail industry very soon. <clears throat> That's because things are getting automated. 20 years ago, you know, people can say, I'm going to start you know, with a job like flipping burgers. Do you think there will still be jobs like that? No, because it can't be automated. So same thing applies to programming. A lot of you know, programming you know, tasks used to be difficult to do, and you have to have you know, a lot of you know, people hours to get it done. And these days, you know, that's a no-brainer. I mean, you, you know, anyone can do it. So, as a computer science student, you know, think about what kind of jobs you know will still be available when you graduate. What do you think? What kind of jobs will still be available and still be in in demand when you graduate? Yep. And what kind of jobs requires problem solving? Software engineering, but in specifically in which area? Security. Security. Okay, who said that? Great. Okay. <laughs> well, this class we'll talk about security a little bit. Um, not only from the standpoint of you know, okay, in general, it's a really cool topic to talk about, but also from the perspective of you know, how do we, we end up with problems? So I will talk about Stack Overflow, you know, exploits in this class. Um, and Cameron was just in my office a little bit earlier, and he was talking about um, Meltdown. Was it Meltdown? And it's a it's a hardware issue. Meltdown is not a software issue; it's a hardware issue, and that's why it is impacting not just Windows, but also Mac OS X and also Linux. Okay, it's a hardware race condition issue. So it's a much lower level type of exploit that we have not really seen for a long, long time, okay? So those jobs will still be on the rise. Yep? Yep. Yep, and yet, you know, we are, moving, we are marching forward to automate just about everything. You know, cars will be automated, you know, it will drive itself. Uh, weapons will drive themselves, right? Okay, so if, if you think about this, you know, it, I just, you know, I, it, it's just amazing to me how we are automating everything. You know, like even attack drones are now getting fully automated, and yet we have issues like meltdown. So if you think about, you know, and so just say the military is ninety percent, you know, automated. Okay, you know, people are just clicking, and you know, we are fighting wars by you know, clicking on the screen. 
And then suddenly someone figure out a security issue like meltdown, where it impacts not only a particular operating system or a version of an operating system, it impacts every known operating system today. What are we going to do? So I'm not going to answer that question, OK? This is a question that you guys will have to answer, because you are going to be in the workforce when that happens. <laughs> Note I said when it happens. It's not a matter of if. It is a matter of when. There was a hand earlier. Yeah, yep. And that's why you know, the, the actual patch will slow down computers significantly. Because in order to make sure there's no race condition, you basically have to make one side always lose that race by slowing it down. Right. I'm suspecting the next uh, revision of Intel and AMD and also ARM chips would have that problem fixed in hardware. But that's just, you know, you know what I think. <laughs> what about that? Um, meltdown is only Intel. Spectre yep. is uh, AMD, ARM, and Intel. Yep. Um, I think Meltdown affects ARM too. That's what I read a little bit earlier. I could be wrong. But it affects ARM, but it's like only certain types. You have to really, really fast. Okay. Yep, so those are kind of interesting topics. Um, you know, not the focus of this class, you know, but something that you might want to keep at the back of your mind because you know when you graduate, a lot of these things become will become important. So this whole section talks about what is understanding and so on and so forth. And right here, you know, since I mentioned gibberish, so you know, if I give you a sentence like this, how do you understand it? <laughs> So this is the sentence, you know, how do you understand this sentence? What is going through your mind as you try to figure out, what is that? What does it mean? Well, you know, if, assuming we're still using English and we're still using the typical grammar of English and the typical way of modifying words so they become, you know, adjectives and verbs become adjectives. So you can kind of understand that, you know, uh, Bojadi is probably an object, a noun, okay? You can understand that uh, emollified, okay, is something being done to, you know, bodily. And then, uh, but it only happens, you know, when you know, a Bojadi is getting nuffaced. <laughs> but but it, it helps you link those concepts, okay? You know, the, the concurrency is implied by the when, okay? And the word becomes implies something is causing something else to happen. Okay, so that's understanding. Okay, it's in this class memorization is not going to get anyone anywhere. You know, that's just it's just not going to be very useful. So so understanding is the key issue. So now the question, you know, the natural question is, but what if I can understand a particular concept? I have no idea what you just said, Tag. What do you think? Hmm? Raise your hand. Raise your hand and ask questions. Okay. <coughs> so, what kind of question will be helpful? Because you know, most you know, some people can just say, "Okay, I have no idea what you just said. Can you can you repeat the whole thing?" That's not going to be very helpful. So, what what do you think is going to be more helpful to me and to the rest of the class? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Cricket. Sounds like it's coming from uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Does anyone want to do the debugging? <laughs> <laughs> it's a real bug. I hope it's not going to melt down. Okay. So the key is to, you know, not to just move on and pretend that, you know, okay, everything is cool. Maybe this concept is not important. I can just kind of move on. Do not make that assumption. Okay, just, you know, make sure that we stop. You know, explain, have that concept explained. If you don't feel comfortable in class asking that question, you can always ask it during the lab time, during my office hour. Okay, yeah, but it is important not to continue 
with the class, you know, without fully understanding all the existing concepts. Okay? Is that part okay? All right. <clears throat> so moving forward. And this class is about problem solving, which means, you know, I, it will be, it won't be surprising if somebody, you know, someone look at the test and go like, but we have never talked about this before. Okay? Because, you know, the solution, you know, or the answer to those particular questions will involve you to make use of multiple concepts in a way that we may not have talked about in class. But each individual concept has been explained already. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what I, what I just said? So I might explain concept A. Okay, give you examples. You might have a homework or some activity that will make use of concept A. Same thing with concept B, same thing with concept C. Okay, I may not show you how to mix these concepts or apply you know, these concepts you know, together to solve a particular problem, okay? But in a test, I might you know, ask you that. So it is about you know, using what you already know, but in ways, in new ways to combine those concepts to solve problems. And why do you think that is important? I mean, trust me, coming up with new questions like that every semester is not easy on me. But why do you think that is important? Because I think you know, this has to resemble what you need to understand and do when you are working. Yep? It makes you more versatile, like solve more problems in the future. It, exactly. So you, if you're given a problem that you have not seen before, you know what to do you know, about it. Okay, so that is important. Now, not all the questions will involve a very high level of problem solving, but they will all have a particular nature, have that nature of problem solving. Okay. All right, when do you, when do you, you know, give up and say, okay, I, I cannot get this homework done, I need to ask someone. Instead of you know, doing the homework assignment independently by yourself, you're now saying, okay, I kind of need some help. So when do you, you know, kind of cross that line? Yep. After you try and then stop and then try again and then stop. <laughs> but, but, so the question is, the threshold is different for each person. Some people may you know, try something for five minutes and then go like, okay, I'm done, I'm giving up. <laughs> give, give me the answer, come on, tell me. Some people may not give up, you know, in a day, maybe two days, okay? So your threshold is entirely up to you. You know, for certain type of homework assignments, you can work together. Okay, so this is a change from past semesters, where you know there are some of the homework assignments where the whole class can work together because it's not graded. But just because it's not graded doesn't mean it's not important. It simply means that I expect people to work together, so I cannot really use the outcome as the individual grade. So I would, you know, I would recommend you know, try to try your best, you know, to solve the problem as much as you can before you give up. Okay, or at least you know don't ask someone to give you, okay, give me the answer. Okay, instead you know you can ask someone, okay, how should I approach this problem? There's a big difference between give me the answer or can you give me a suggestion of what to proceed, you know, at this point? What concept, you know, tell me what concepts are important to solve this problem. In other words, instead of having someone to kind of show you how to use a tool to make something, that person is really just mentioning, oh, remember that hammer in your toolbox? That might come in handy. Remember that you know, special drill that we bought the other day? That might come in handy. So mentioning that you know, to help out the other person is what I think you know, would be helpful. But not necessarily go like, okay, let me show you how to do it do the whole thing you know, for the other person. The other person can then just kind of copy the whole process. Okay, so that is that. Study before class, grading policy. Okay, so this is the weird part of this class, or one of the weird part of this class. <clears throat> the ABCDF you know, standard, everybody knows, because that's uh, how we do the GPA stuff, right? So an A is 4.0, a B is 3.0, and so on and so forth. The first row, the first row is the short description, which is consistent with most, if not all, universities. 
and A is considered excellent, B is good, a C is satisfactory slash fair, a D, interestingly, is a low pass, okay? Um, and an F is a fail, okay? So that part is kind of common, you know, commonly understood. But exactly what does it mean when I give you a score, give you, you know, the point values? An A means it is a perfect answer, cannot be any better, shows complete understanding of the material and the ab ability to apply the knowledge to solve problems, perfect execution. There's n I cannot you know, pick anything that is wrong with that particular answer. A B is good, but with only minor flaws or mistakes or omissions of some kind, but it does show complete understanding of the material. It's just that ah, there's a little bit of stupid mistake somewhere. Okay. A C means it is just marginally showing me that the uh, the core concept is understood, but there are some peripheral concepts you know that is not you know understood or there's significant mistakes and you know it's just yeah, kind of barely passing. A D means you know it does not show sufficient understanding of the material or the skill to apply the knowledge. And F basically means there's no answer or the answer does not show any evidence whatsoever of the under of an understanding of the concept. Is that okay? All right, cool. And if that doesn't work, you can always look from the perspective of job evaluation or product evaluation these days. When was the last time you bought something from Amazon or do some shopping and evaluate you know, something, whether you should buy it or not? Today, right now, three minutes earlier? <laughs> So what is a five-star product? That's an A product, right? Okay, it's a product that is worthy of the grade of an A. Okay, cannot be any better. Exceeds expectation. Does everything you expect it to do, and then some, right? What is a four-star product on Amazon? Would you buy a four-star product? Yeah, because it, it, it does what it claims it will do. It's just that it doesn't give you anything more than what it promises. Okay, what about a, a three-star product? How, what differentiates a four-star product from a three-star product on Amazon? Hmm? It's passable, exactly. It's like if I don't have a choice, you know, I guess it's okay. Okay, it's just it's just barely to the level that you're not going to return it. What about a two-star product? It doesn't work well, right? You're going to return it. Or if you cannot return, you'll tell people not to buy it. What about one star product? <laughs> that product burned your house down. <laughs> By plugging that thing into the electrical outlet, it burned your house down. Not only did it not do what it's supposed to do, not, if, not only did it not do a single thing, it caused problems. Okay? So that's you know, just you know, kind of ways to talk about this. Okay, so how do I assign your letter grade? If you get at least 87.5% of all the points you know, in this entire semester, you get an A. If you get anything between 62.5% and 87.5%, that's a B. And it just kind of goes like this. You know, a C is from 37.5% to 62.5%. Um, a D is from 12.5% to 37.5% and an F is less than 12.5%. Does that make this class easier? <laughs> Why not? Sorry? Well, because I don't have any multiple choice tests for one thing. I don't have anything that requires just regurgitation or memorization. Everything is about problem solving. Okay, so there's no fluff. I don't need that 60% to kind of fill up <laughs> the bucket. All right, so activities in this class. So within the graded activities, there will be 20% assigned to assignments. And you know, I have not really done any quizzes. I might start to do it this semester. So that's 20% of your grade, and you, know, you, can, you can read about the details here. Um, there are three exams. The first exam, because you know, somebody asked about, you know, okay, so when are we going to have you know, exams? The first exam is worth 20% of your final grade. 
This is usually at about one third through the duration of the semester. So you know, kind of figure out, you know, in week five or so, you know, week five, week six or so, we'll have the first exam. The second exam is also all uh, 20%, and this one is about two thirds through the whole semester. So it's gonna be week 11-ish, you know, with the second exam. The final exam is 40%, and this is all the way to the end. You know what a final exam is. And I can see someone is you know, already thinking, hey, if I just ace the final exam, I can pass this class with a C. <laughs> and that is true. That is absolutely true. Okay? But this is not a challenge. I'm not saying, okay, try it. <laughs> Okay, this section is new. So even if you have taken classes from me before, this section is new. I will start to give you guys ungraded assignments. Um, for two reasons I'm not grading these assignments. One, it is a lot of work. Two, I want you guys to work together. Okay, in any number of, you know, if you want like 10 people in the group, go ahead. I would not recommend 10 people. Yep. Uh, will we know if these are ungraded beforehand? Or yes. I will announce whether something is graded or not, you know, prior to assigning it. So a graded assignment, you know, would be something that at the end of the class, I would just go like, okay, so this is going to be a homework assignment. It will help you understand the material. When you're doing this assignment, it is study, okay? This is study, but it is not going to be graded. So if it's not going to be graded, okay, how are you going to learn from doing this homework assignment? What do you think? Practice. It's the practice, but how do you know whether you got it right or not? It'll be on the test, okay? You know, that's one reason why you want to do it, but how is this going to help you learn the material if it's not graded? Okay, so first of all, I will give you a solution. I will give you my solution. So when you have your solution and you have my solution, what do you do? You compare the two solutions, right? Now, my solution is not always, quote unquote, the better solution or the correct solution. Your solution can be just as correct, but you have to analyze the two solutions and come to that conclusion. What if you're not sure? You ask me, okay? You, you show me your solution and you say, okay, this is my solution, and I see that it's not entirely the same as your solution, but is this still a good and correct solution? You can ask me, and I can help you evaluate. I will also give you test cases. When a homework assignment is due, and also be when I assign it, I'll give you test cases. I'll give you test cases where, okay, plug these numbers in, this should be the output. Plug these numbers in, that should be the output, okay? So if your solution works for all of those test cases, it's good indication that it is correct, but it is no proof that it is entirely correct. Is that okay? All right, so this section is new, and um, you know, I, this is all just repetition of what I said. All right, so this is the whole syllabus, and we spent mm, a good amount of time. Are there any questions about the syllabus? Yep. Um, other than these unassigned uh, or ungraded assignments, um, will there be any group work? Um, any group work would not be graded, you know, because you know it's kind of difficult to be fair when you have a group of people working on the same thing. Now, I know, you know, at work, you know, this is kind of what you have to do. You know, you have to work with coworkers and whatnot. Um, but in this class, you know, if it is graded, it is individual work. Yep. Okay. So we, we got the uh, syllabus out of the way. So we can now start to talk about, um, this is your lab activity. Uh, the early lab has done this already. So the second lab, you know, the lab that starts at 8.30, will actually do this. So um, this is something for you to do in the lab. So instead of doing that, I'm gonna go to my notes here. So this is the format of everything, everything that I quote unquote publish. Uh, there's a PDF version. I mean, you know what PDF is, okay? It's uh, you can print it out, you know, put it into a binder or whatever. Um, but in class, I'm going to use the HTML version just because you know I can zoom. I, it, 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 it's easier to d display on a projector. All right. So we're so the first part of this is going 
to the physical devices. In other words, we're looking at computers, but we're not looking at the computer as a black box, okay? We're actually looking at the computer you know, in terms of the components. What is inside a computer? What makes it a computer? So in the good old days, you know, there are electromechanical computers. Um, can someone name a famous electromechanical computer? I scrolled already for that purpose. <laughs> so at the end of World War II, the Enigma machine is not quote unquote a computer. It is a fairly mechanical device to do encryption. Um, but the bomb computer that does all the deciphering is a computer. How many people have watched um, the imitation game? Okay, I'm kind of disappointed. I see about one third of the class. Okay, so in that particular movie, the computer that Turing was working on was a electromechanical computer. So it has mechanical aspects, you know, things turns and clicks and you know, move, but it's also electrical. So the context, you know, is important. So that's an electromechanical computer. They're really slow, okay? So they're very slow compared to other types of mechanisms, mostly because of the mechanical aspect. There's only so fast you can turn the gear, okay? Because it's physical. And then we move on to vacuum tubes, okay? So each of these um, hyperlink you know, links to a Wikipedia page. So for those of you who say, okay, I have to know what it is, you know, you can just kind of click that. So a um, so getting back to you know the famous computers you know that are vacuum tube computers, uh, the Colossus is the first really famous um, vacuum tube type of computer. Um, and then the, that particular computer is also a deciphering computer, but it is not the counter to the Enigma encryption. It is the counter to the Lorenz pronunciation cipher. Um, the difference between these two ciphers is one is really portable. It's kind of like the size of a typewriter. The other one is huge. Okay, so you can only use it in the headquarters. You cannot you know, use it in the field. But the, in, uh, the encryption mechanism is also far more complex, so you need a vacuum tube computer to give you the speed to do the deciphering. And then we move on to transistors. We're still in the era of transistors, by the way. Okay, we really have not gone past transistors at this point. So a transistor is also known as a semiconductor device because uh, the main material that we use to make a transistor is quote unquote semiconducting. So how can something be semiconducting? What does it mean, semiconducting? Yep. Uh, you can conduct on and off, so like sometimes it'll conduct it, sometimes Okay, go ahead. Yep, so you're both correct. Okay, a semiconductor device is one that can conduct or not conduct. <coughs> so it depends on you know the direction of the current and a few other factors. So I went on to kind of explain you don't have to understand the actual nature of a transistor. But you know, every transistor that we have today, even the ones currently in the Intel processors, the highest end processor, they're still based on a simple PN junction. It's just that you know the way you configure the junction is different. The way you create a junction is different. Okay, the, <coughs> the older types of transistors is also called BJT or bi BJT bi junction transistor. They are um, they consume more current. They are power hungry, but they are more reliable, more robust in many ways. And then the current transistors that we use are called field effect transistors. Um, they do not consume a lot of current. They are very small. Um, they are very high in terms of efficiency, um, but they're still transistors. All right. So, what is common between a transistor, a vac and or and a vacuum tube? I'm not going to get to the electrical, the electromechanical device. Well, I suppose we can. We can use relays. Does it? Does everybody understand what is a relay in terms of electrical components? Okay, so we can use that too. We can use a relay. So what is common between a relay, vacuum tubes, 
and transistors. Okay, they can be turned on and off. But what, is it, what does it mean when you say it's turned on and it is turned off? What, what, what does it do when something is on? Yep. It, it allows flow. Okay, very good. Okay, so all of these are basically valves. They can be turned on to allow flow. They can be turned off to stop flow. Okay, very good. But then what about that faucet at home? Right? A faucet is definitely a valve. You can turn it on, you can turn it off. You turn it on, water comes out, and you turn it off, water is stopped. What about, what is so special about these particular valves that is different from the valve that you have in your kitchen? Yep. Yeah, that's one, but not the only one. Not the most important difference. Yep. You can, well, you can have a lot of faucets. <laughs> You can make a water-based computer. The difference is when you have when, when you're looking at that faucet in your kitchen, how do you turn it on? What what turns on and what turns off the faucet? Mechanically, your hands, right? It's not water. It's not turning on or turning off due to the flow of water. The very same kind of quantity that it is controlling is not the one that the stuff that is turning it on, turning it off. What about relays? What turns on a relay? What turns what, what actuates a relay? Smaller current. Hmm? A smaller current. A smaller current, which is electrical, right? Yeah. But what is it control? What is what is it stopping and allowing to flow? Also current. Okay, so that is the key. Okay? Whatever valve we are, we need to use for computers, it needs to use the same physical thing to control the valves and it turns on and turns off the same physical thing as a result. Is that okay? <coughs> sort of? Okay. So now we're gonna start to talk about physical states. Um, so when we look at transistors, there are two states for the most part, okay? It's either on, it is allowing flow, or it is off, it is not gonna allow flow. Same thing for a relay, okay? Is the relay, you know, connected? Is it closed or is it open where it is not conducting? Okay. But in computer science, okay, when in math, we are not concerned about transistors. We're concerned about truth. When was the first time that you had to deal with true and false? I mean, in terms of computer, this track of computer classes. In CISP 300, CISP 360. So, what what do we use the you know, truth or truth values for? Booleans, okay. And how do we utilize Boolean expressions, things that can evaluate to either true or false? Hmm? If statements, okay. So, what what about if statements? What what is the significance of it? It can go one way or the other way. Okay, it can branch, right? Okay. So now we we talk about you know how do so the, so the next few things you know we are not going to have enough time to finish this entire thing. We got five more minutes. So I can you 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 need to read this on your own. Okay, uh, before the next class, you know, at least with read through this entire you know uh, document. So you got to do that. But the trajectory okay what the way we are going in this case is we are first introducing your know, transistors we have an n transistor we have a p transistor okay they're very kind of they look really similar but they're minor differences and then we talk about a circuit like this okay so i just kind of briefly if you have not done the lab activity today uh this is what we're going to do you know in at 8 30. So don't worry, you don't have to copy anything down because this whole thing is going to be explained as a part of that activity. So in this case, we have a circuit. <coughs> this is power. Okay, so just kind of imagine that you have a like a battery system. This is the plus. This is the minus. Okay, you, we just call it power and ground in the electrical circuit. Um, these two are input pins, and this one is an output pin. In other words, you can control the voltage of the input pins and you can measure the voltage of the output pin. Is that okay? So now we got a we got four transistors. We have Q1, Q2 being P transistors, 
We got Q3 and Q4B and transistors. As transistors, they are bonds, right? So the gate, which is this part here, is going to control. That's that's your knob, okay? That's your faucet. This is how you turn on and turn off something. But the difference between these two types of transistors is they are complementary to each other. For a P-channel MOSFET or P-type uh, transistor, when the input is low, the transistor is off. For an N-channel transistor, when the input is high, the transistor is off. Is that okay? In other words, you have two kinds of valves, okay? One type of valve, if you turn this way, you turn it on. And then the other valve, you turn it the other way to turn it on. Is that okay? Yep. I've worked a little bit with logic gates before. Is this similar, is it similar to the P versus N of, of using a knot versus? A little bit like that, but these are actual physical devices. In other words, if you go to Fry's, you can go buy yourself like two actual you know, P transistors, you can buy yourself two actual N transistors and make this circuit. So now the question is, what does this circuit do? <coughs> For those of you who did the, um, the lab already, you kind of go like, oh yeah, if we flip you know, the signals you know, you know, from zero to one and one to zero, you know, there are certain combinations that will turn the output to a one, and certain combinations that will turn off the output. Okay? So I'll give you a, pre a, a quick summary and the truth table. So all, all of this is an explanation of how the circuit works. So you have to kind of dig and read through this stuff because it is kind of important. But the conclusion, I want to jump to the conclusion right now because you know I'm running out of time, but I do want to show you what you're reading, why this is important. This is the truth table, okay? X, Y are the inputs and the output obviously is just the output. So if this is a truth table, zero means false and one which is not zero is true, what does that look like? Does it resemble any operator that you have seen in programming, in CISP 300 or CISP 360? It's also... Hmm? Not N. Not N, exactly. It is a negated N, okay? Which is called an N, N-A-N-D, okay? So it's a NAND gate, NAND2, two, two input NAND gate. Big deal, okay? So now we have some really obscure operator that you have never seen ever in your other programming classes. So what is the big deal of a NAND2 gate? If I know, if I know how to make a NAND2 gate, what is the significance? Yep. You can build all of the other ones. An NAND2 gate is all we need. Out of an NAND, out of NAND2 gates, not a single one, okay, I can make a NOT gate. I can make a regular AND gate. I can make a regular OR gate. In other words, give me four transistors, I can give you a NAND2 gate. But give me a bunch of NAND2 gates, I can give you every single logical operator that you already know. Right. So what is the significance of that? Ignoring the details, ignoring the explanations, what is the significance at the end of this entire document? What is the significance of, oh, give me transistors, I can give you um, an electrical <coughs> mechanism to do the logical expressions that you have done in all of your other programming classes. What is the significance of this? We are bridging from yeah, go ahead. <coughs> we are bridging from physical devices to things that you already know, to Boolean operations. And nobody seems to be impressed. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we just went from individual transistors that you can buy at Fry's, okay? Make circuits, you know, get a soldering iron, you know, you know, twist the wires, and we can make things that can perform the operations that you thought, hey, I can do this in a program. Now we can actually do it with a device. And guess what? Inside the processor, it's just a whole lot of these things. <laughs> okay? It's all just transistors. But out of transistors, we can build these gates. Okay, now, I know we are running out of time. It's 21 right now. But I will show you the overall trajectory of this class. 
So after this, we will talk about numbers and bases because you know, base two is really important in this class, binary numbers. So I want to explain that. And then we'll talk about how to add numbers in binary and how to subtract number in binaries. But when you click on these slides, they're not really just talking about, oh, you know, well, the, the rules of subtraction is a little bit different, the rules of addition is a little bit different. It will explain that. But it will also boil everything back down to logic gates. In other words, these two topics will explain how do you make a circuitry to perform addition? How do you build a circuitry to do subtraction? Because guess what? Your processor can perform the, all those operations. So we are step by step building up all the building blocks. At the very end of this class, we'll start with the compiling C control structures into assembly code. Assembly code translate in, translates into opcode, and then the opcode will run in a processor that is in simulation. And then in that particular processor will be components that we can that every single component can boil down to logic gates. And we already know that logic gates can boil down to transistors. So at the very end of this whole class, okay, you will start to understand how you will look at C code differently. Because every time you see a C code, you will think of, oh, everything can boil down to transistors at a hardware level. Okay? So that's just kind of an overview of you know, what we're going to do in this class. But for now, we're going to focus in on the NAND 2 gate out of four transistors. So make sure you read that particular slide or document, and then we'll you know, get back to this on Thursday. If you're in the second lab, you know, we'll go to room 409. Just kind of follow me, or if you know where to find it, you can go there first. Uh,